Salutations, respected viewers. I am George from Ireland, and so I'm on Oakley Street in Chelsea, London. Behind me is the house where Scott of the Antarctic lived uh, towards the end of his life. Not the very end of his life, because he expired a long distance from here, um, at the uttermost end of the earth. So Scott was born in 1868 uh, into a middle-class family in England. Presumably they must have had Scott's ancestry, hence his surname. Uh, so he um, entered Royal Naval Services, commissioned as an officer, and uh, that was when Britannia ruled the waves. The Royal Navy was huge. The Naval Defence Act required that the Royal Navy um, have double power standard, which is to say, be as big as the second biggest and the third biggest combined. The idea being that if they ever joined forces, the Royal Navy could outnumber them. Now, standing this far back, you have some idea of the size of the house. You see the blue plaque there, that's the door, so it goes right up to here. So it's obviously quite well off. Uh, Chelsea was a, was a smart area even then, particularly this street, and it's, it's very close to the Thames. Now, if I got it right, that is Chelsea Bridge there. I always get Chelsea Bridge and Battersea Bridge. The sky is so white, it's quite difficult to make out. There's not enough colour contrast. I don't know how to fiddle around with the colour on this one. Anyway, um, so I had a distinguished uh, Royal Naval career. Uh, married, had one child. But uh, cut to the chase, what's he, he's best known as a polar explorer. And uh, it came to 1912, and... Uh, the South Pole was about the only place on Earth they hadn't reached, and people had mapped the oceans. Um, so uh, an informal race was started, who could be the first one to get to the South Pole? Uh, now, of course, the seasons the opposite way around back then, uh, in, sorry, then, in the, the, well, there in the South Pole, so June is midwinter, i.e. December is midsummer. And I remember one of my pupils saying, oh, that means they celebrate Christmas in the summer. Well, um, I suppose it's their summer, but then it celebrated in June, and that's what we went on to say. Um, so they were trying to reach uh, there in December, because that would be the longest hours of daylight and the mildest temperatures. So and the Norwegians were trying to do it as well. His great rival, uh, British rival in polar exp exploration, was Sir Ernest Shackleton. Uh, now, um, uh, Ernest was Irish, i.e., therefore he was British. I know people are going to throw the toys out of the pram when I said that one. That Kildare man was British. Anyway, um, he and Scott didn't always get on, and Scott considered this his baby, that Shackleton was intruding what he shouldn't do. Shackleton, um, was he in the Royal Navy as well? I feel he was. He wasn't a doctor, because his father was a doctor. But, yeah, back to, uh, back to polar exploration. Um, so should he have taken more food? He'd been in a number of polar expeditions and always tried himself, he ought to have taken more food. Uh, anyway, it's not just, it was a British Empire uh, expedition, it was not just guys from the United Kingdom, i.e. Ireland and Great Britain, but uh, also people from, say, Australia, South Africa and so forth. And uh, he put out an advert in the newspapers, uh, really trying to put people off, saying, uh, attempt to get to the South Pole, long hours, fearful cold, return doubtful. But he got hundreds of applications. And according to that 1948 film, one bloke resigned his commission in the army in India, came all the way to London to apply. But I think he, there was some correspondence first. He didn't just show up on spec because he might have been turned down. And um, so there were over 20 men. One of them was Tom Green from, from Anaskal, County Kerry. And there's still the South Pole pub uh, run in Anaskal to this day. Um, he was in the Royal Navy. Uh, anyway, so they got to Antarctica. And why is Antarctica? Because there are no bears. The Arctic has bears, as in, that means, um, of bears in Antarctica. No bears. Penguins instead. But I don't think you can eat those. Well, I'm not trying eating a polar bear either. Uh, anyhow, um, they, were, they weren't all going to go all the way. They're going to be four for the final assault. And so, the, the Roald Amundsen and the Norwegian team, they were using dogs. Amundsen loved the taste of a hound. And so have the um, huskies or whatever they were pulling the sleighs of food. The men going along once in a while, the dog that was lagging behind, eat it, give any leftovers to the other canines and keep on going. But uh, now uh, Falcon saying, we're British, we simply don't eat curs. Man's best friend and all that. Um, but had ponies, but I think the ponies all died. So they had to manhaul their food. Now, there's a bit of a trade-off here, because the more food you have, the more you've got a margin of error, but then that's more weight to carry, that's going to slow you down, burn more calories. The less food you have, it's lighter, you're going to go faster, you're not going to consume much energy, 
But if you miscalculate, you're going to run out of food and there's no food in the Arctic. Have to kill and eat one of your men, I suppose. But they don't seem to have considered cannibalism. Anyway, it was a very hard trip and he probably made a, a fatal mistake by choosing Lawrence Oates, this army officer, Old Etonian, um, because Oates was from a wealthy family and in return for his place in the expedition, contributed a lot of money, but was always moaning, a cheery old pessimist, as, as Scott called him. Um, anyway, so uh, they, they were approaching the South Pole and that was it. It had been very tough. They'd buried food, they'd mapped where it was. They're gonna find the, the, the cairns and uh, there were four of them in the, the final assault and seeing this dark shape on the horizon as they got closer, what was it? It was moving. It was more like red. Was there a bit of blue? Was there a white line on it? It was the Norwegian flag. Their hearts sank, the Norwegians beaten them to it. And, and Scott kept a diary, because sometimes they're in their tents and there could be a howling gale outside for a few days. Um, so because of these terrible snowstorms, sometimes they, they, they just couldn't move. And then they were trying not to get too dispirited and not, not to run through their rations. What else are you going to, going to do? There was no entertainment. So they didn't gel as a team and uh, perhaps he wasn't such a fantastic leader. It's a topic which is hotly debated this day. Anyway, so they, they got there. Okay, coming second in the whole world is not bad. Retracing their steps to try and dig up the food as they went. Um, and so far so good, but they fell ill. Um, Titus Oates, well, he's actually Lawrence Oates, but they nicknamed him Titus, as in after the 18th century, sorry, 17th century figure who invented the, the Popish plot. Um, and they dug up their uh, comestibles and they kept going, but Oates fell very ill, was, had pneumonia, was lagging behind. Um, and then one evening, according to Scott's journal, it says, um, Oates said, um, I'm just going out some, uh, outside, I may be some time, and never returned, and walked out in, in light clothing um, into a shrieking gale, knowing he was going to swiftly die of exposure. He was immolating himself on the altar of comradeship. He knew he was slowing down his teammates. They had to go at his pace. So if he allowed himself to be killed by the weather, committed suicide if you prefer, it was gonna give the others a fighting chance of making it. But uh, they had various illnesses and there was no radio. There was no way to be evacuated. And one by one they succumbed. And then, uh, so Scott was in his tent, the last surviving one, writing something in his diary saying, um, um, Surely, surely a wealthy country like ours will provide amply for our kin. Words to that, to that effect. And saying, um, if only we could have got home, what, what a tale of hardy wood would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. Um, but these rough notes in our bones must tell the tale. That's Is Ipsissima uh, Vox, by the way. You can see some of it inscribed on one of his statues, one of the statues that honours him on, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the place of it, near the Athenaeum, anyway. There's a statue of him as well um, at Portsmouth, as in the headquarters of the Royal Navy, other plaques to him here and there. So um, he hadn't returned, 1912 into 1913, what's happening, where is he? Um, and eventually a, a rescue expedition was, was, was launched, but they must have known that they would have long since run out of food. Um, and you need so many calories to keep yourself warm, and especially the, the exercise they're doing, dragging their big packs behind them. Um, and their bodies were found actually quite well preserved um, because of the uh, gelid temperatures. And he, he's buried there under a cairn. And it, obviously his diary was found, presumed it would be found. So his child was well provided for, went on to do a PhD, and his son lived to a ripe old age. So that is Scott. Was he an outstanding leader? Did he, did he provide marvelous examples of leadership? Is he a heroic failure? Or was it, was he dreadful? He failed. He didn't get to the whole first. Uh, he should have realized that they, this, he'd miscalculated in terms of food and all the rest of it. They should have scotched it, they could have gone back. But he also wrote in his diary that things have come out against us and we don't feel sorry for ourselves, we're not angry, and we don't blame anyone. And we wouldn't be into that these days with Elf and the safety. But uh, you knew you're doing something highly dangerous, which is why it's supposed to be so glorious. So don't ask for sympathy, sympathy when it all goes tits up. So some people think that there's this cult of... of um, uh, Scott needs to be taken down, he needs to be debunked. And uh, in the early 1960s, at uh, the, the establishment nightclub, um, oh my God, I've forgotten his name. Ah, the tall, willowy one who launched that, part of the satire boom, and never mind, a friend of Monty Python's, it'll come to me the name, uh, said uh, this guy should be, should be taken down, should be lampooned, because he was a failure and he's not someone we ought to adulate. Um, so that is Scott of the Antarctic. All right, so toodaloo.